and uh, I was an undergraduate at George Mason, so it's a good uh, thrill to be back in a professional capacity, not as a, an undergraduate. Um, so I, uh, the paper was already a bit too long, and now it's, it's, it's really too long, so I'm just going to draw sort of key parts um, from it. I'm going to go very quickly through sort of the framing framework of it, which is I, I think that the concept of, of mobilization framing, which we get from social movement theory, which is really a set of theories, is, is quite useful in uh, looking at how uh, issues such as sectarianization, uh, sectarianism or commun uh, communalism, excessive communalism, or uh, in the case of my dissertation, the organization of certain forms of political violence and the utilization of it, the framing of it, uh, is quite useful. What, what social movement theory means by framing basically is the creation of certain kinds of interpretive lenses through which people perceive world events and, and current events and through which they develop a sense of group and, and self-identity. And um, it's also very important to note uh, as, uh, that these frames only have resonance on, under very specific uh, sort of contexts. They're not, they're designed within certain contexts and they only have resonance uh, or power really within certain contexts, sort of so socio-political, economic. Um, about the sort of conflict, really it's, it's again, as, as a number of uh, my colleagues have already um, discussed, really this idea of Sunni versus Shi is really quite simplistic. And so, for example, even if we take uh, ISIS, that their definition of Sunni is, is really just them, uh, actually. But uh, so who do they mean? Who do different groups mean by Ahl Sunni al Jamaa? Right? So for ISIS, it's basically them. For Al Qaeda, it's really only us, but maybe you could join us. If you do certain things, we'll let you in our, our club. I'm talking about the original Al Qaeda organization, the Zawahiri bin Laden version. Um, of course, there are different sort of regional uh, branches, which I'll, I'll touch on uh, a bit later. For sort of the, some of the competing voices, however, right, the, the, what they, the way that they frame the conflict is not so much sort of sectarian or Sunni or Shashi, but to something even more broad in some ways as a, a conflict over what is Islam, whose, whose Islam is true, which I don't know if that makes the discussion any bit easier, but so for example, certainly I, I don't think I need to sort of detail how ISIS does that, but from uh, certain voices, uh, a juridical voice, for example, for certain segments of the, of, uh, for example, um, some of the Iraqi Shi'i militias which are active in Syria, uh, a Grand Mujtahid in Qom, an Iraqi Grand Mujtahid in Qom, Qadim Hadari. For example, he was asked two, twice by, by some of his Muqaladun in, in 2013. I think it's interesting that he didn't release this independently, that they were basically just responses to questions to him. Basically, what is the position juridically I'm going to fight in Syria? Uh, among, uh, one is much shorter than the other, but in the longer one he says, it's actually not just a, a question of going, of defending the, the holy sites of the Muqaddasat, of Sayyid al Ruqayya, Sayyid al Zainab in, in Syria. It's actually a question uh, quote unquote, uh, confronting unbelief in its entirety. Muajahat al kufr Unbelief targeting the light of Islam. End quote. Um, and again, similarly, Islamic State, certain. Um, bin Laden. In bin Laden's discourse, you, we have very little or almost nothing about sort of uh, you know, sectarian quote unquote differences. Zawahiri, similarly, yes, on the one hand, he, he does call Shiites and and Ahmadis and Ismailis and, and etc. Alawis as uh, you know Farak Muharafa. He does say that they're deviant, but he doesn't. It really kind of stops that. He doesn't go into exhaustive detail about you know this creedal point is really problematic and this creedal point is really problematic. He says you know what Iran uh, Iran uh, has done this and Iran has uh, aided uh, the Khatami, aided the overthrow of the Taliban, and in 2003 it basically turned a blind eye to the American invasion and occupation of Iraq. So, you know, look at, Iran has done everything that it, it, it possibly can to harm the Muslims, by which he means, of course, uh, the Ahl al-Sunnah al jamaa which he claims to be representing. Um, as is probably quite well known, right, the, the Zawahiri and other Al-Qaeda leaders have an issue with Zarqawi's sort of blanket targeting of Shiites. There's a PR aspect to this, of course, that it, it doesn't, didn't look good. Um, but, uh, Basically, the, the, the reasoning that, that people like Zawahiri gave and have given is primarily so, you know, political about uh, why they oppose certain Shiite self, you know, uh, actors. Um, you know, even, for example, where Zawahiri in a 2009 interview um, with 
one of Al-Qaeda's media organs, said, you know, not even a single Shi'i uh, grand marja has uh, permitted or allowed uh, or called for or permitted uh, fighting the Americans in Iraq, right? And in 2007, he even tries to take away certain Shiite historical figures and saying, look, Iran is not deserving of being called the descendants of uh, Imam Hussein. We are the real descendants of Imam Hussein because we are fulfilling, um, you know, the quote-unquote the duties of Islam, uh, the Islamic duties that were required. Um, this, there are, uh, of course, different um, levels of anti-Shiism um, within other Al-Qaeda regional affiliates. And there are, for example, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Jabhat al-Nusra, of course, and to a uh, lesser degree, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, which is a particular interest of mine. There, for some of them, there are, uh, in addition to sort of current events and, and dynamics, there are organizational reasons. For example, the presence in, in AQAP or, uh, and rather, Nusra of certain figures who have particular histories which they bring with them. So for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula, people such as the late Ibrahim al rubaish and Saeed al-Shihri, both <laughs> formerly uh, detainees at Guantanamo, who were both Saudi and brought with them a, a very kind of, uh, especially Saeed al-Shihri, a very virulent anti-Shiism. Um, within Nusra, there are, again, there are a number of the senior Nusra leadership, including the late uh, Abu Firas al-Suri, who was just recently killed by the US in Idlib. Um, is a veteran of the Tariq al muqatila the most radical or most extreme uh, sort of offshoots of the, the Syrian Ikhwan. And of course, there's the whole history of the, the uprising in, in, in the early 80s against the Ba'ath. Um, for al-Shabaab, is a more interesting case, uh, similar to what, what Dr. Dr. Wajmakers was talking about, and, and the sort of the very strong anti-Shiism, and in the case of al-Shabaab, also anti-Christianity, anti-Hinduism, anti-Buddhism, in a context which there are no significant populations of these uh, folks on the ground. But for example, in, in, in 2011, when it still controlled sort of vast amounts of, of territory, including urban centers, Al-Shabaab's Maktab um, Al-Tarbiyah wa Ta'lim tried to implement, issued and tried to implement a very exhaustive uh, education initiative in which the primary focus was on, you know, quote unquote, um, countering the spread of unbelieving and Western methodologies. And they list Halloism and the, the, the religion of the, the, the slaves of the cross, and etc. And Shiites and Alois are very are at the top of the list. And it's kind of, why is this? On the surface, it, it possibly could be because people like Zarqawi and sort of the early Islamic State of Iraq leadership, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, and, and, and particularly Abu Hamza al Muhajar were very popular and have been very popular with Shabab's uh, senior leadership. However, I think really the main dynamic was sort of the presence of certain uh, local um, strong Salafi figures, Somali Salafi figures, like Abdul Qadir Mu'min, who recently defected or gave bay'ah to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and his vocation is uh, unknown now, and also someone who is still present in Shabab, Fuad Muhammad uh, Khalaf Shangala who, for example, in uh, this past New Year, warned Somalis against practicing or marking or celebrating the Kufr uh, Christian New Year. Uh, these figures have had, who have been involved with Shabab since the beginning, since, since it's, uh, it was part of the Islamic Courts Union and, and after it emerged as an independent organization, have been sort of ideologically very important. Um, and also, um, I'll skip that part, actually. So the second sort of part that I wanted to talk about is this sort of resurrection of certain historical figures and the re not resurrection so much as the retooling of them for very contemporary purposes. So for example, when, when some of the Shia militias in Iraq, sorry, not in Iraq, in Syria, well, in Iraq as well, but Syria, um, talk about certain historical figures like Abu Fadl al-Abbas, Asaida Zainab, that they, uh, in certain cases more than others, Saida Zainab, for example, they kind of retool her so the the more independent and the more um, the stronger version of Zainab, which, which uh, for example, uh, during Muharram uh, Majalis, when we hear about her, her speech to Ibn Ziyad and her speech uh, against uh, to Yazid um, after Karbala, uh, is kind of put under the carpet, and her feminine, quote unquote, nature is resurrected. She's in need of defending. We are the new Abbases. We're going to defend her. Um, this is something which is both unofficial and official. So, for example, in October, 
uh, of last year when uh, the Sipahi Pazdaran general, the, the highest Sipah officer other than Soleimani, who was, uh, who was actually permanently in Iraq, uh, sorry, in uh, Syria, Hossein Hamadani, when he was killed by uh, ISIS in north, north of Aleppo, uh, outside of his house and in official media organs of the Iranian state, and specifically of the Sipah and of the Basije Mustazafan, uh, refer to this statement of Kulana Abbas Kulana Zainab. And they have this picture, and they have sort of a martyrdom, sort of martyrology kind of iconography. Um, turning to what sort of, how can local and organizational dynamics be both a help and an impediment to, to, to ISIS specifically? So in Somalia, the, the popularity of Zarqawi, for example, did, did not transfer to his, his uh, to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And in fact, al-Shabaab has been quite the Al Shabaab senior leadership meeting has been quite uh, strong about uh, working against those it thinks are going to defect to to Islamic State, and those who have, many of them have either been arrested preemptively or have been killed. In fact, have been killed, and this is how Shabaab has um, thank you, has treated sort of internal dissension for a while. Similarly, in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan. <laughs> The group that now calls itself Wilayat Khorasan, the sort of purported Wilayat Khorasan, I think it's interesting and important to note that the leader of this, this faction or this province uh, of ISIS, uh, Hafiz Said Khan, uh, was formerly the Tariq e Taliban Pakistan Emir in Orgzai, which Orgzai has a particular uh, history, recent, fairly recent history between um, sort of um, social classes, Sunni, uh, sort of Shi'i feudal landlords. And, and Sunni or, or non-Shi uh, sort of um, peasantry, which has played into sectarian or communal, intercommunal violence there. And I don't think really that it's a coincidence that, that uh, the leader of Walayat Khorasan is coming from Orgzai. Uh, skipping to sort of the last, um, one of the other interesting sort of a new way of looking at sectarianism or the use of the sectarian label, I think is the intra-jihadi, particularly speaking about the Sunni, intra-jihadi use of the term Kharajai, sort of uh, playing a bit off Professor Kenny's um, presentation earlier, about how it basically is seems to be kind of de-anchored from any kind of real historical, on the one hand, on the surface, it seems very historical, you know, the, the, the Kharajites, the original Kharajites, the actual Kharajites, did X, Y, Z, and look, this modern group is doing X, Y, Z. But really what it seems to be is that when, for example, Nusra leaders and Nusra commanders accuse Islamic State of being Kharajites, they don't really explain. They, they Usually the format is they give a long list of offenses that ISIS has done. They refuse to, uh, they've rebelled in a way against the legitimate, quote unquote, leadership of Zawahiri. They have uh, refused to go into mediation or arbitration. They have killed other Muslims. But really it's kind of, and then they have this historical, quote unquote, part that they add at the end. Uh, which is, look, okay, look, it's foretold, and, and look, it matches, and you know, they leave you kind of to do, to, to match it up with uh, one another. Um, so, and then I'll close, I think, just with, um, basically, so for example, but there are also, you know, personal dynamics. So probably the most, arguably the most anti-ISIS Nusra commander, and certainly one of the ones who's been at the forefront of, of pushing this, this new neo Khawarij label on Abu Mari al Kahdani, has also, in addition to sort of other reasons, has personal reasons as well to not like ISIS, because formerly he was the Nusra Amir and Dar Azor, and uh, ISIS sort of he was ignominiously chased him out, uh, and so he's been really pushing for this uh, the term. Um, in terms of like, uh, and I'll close on this, the sort of refighting of the past and the present, bringing up really old historical conflicts and saying and claiming that they're being refought now either in Syria or Iraq or Lebanon or Pakistan, and the resurrection of, of figures like Ali and Hussein and Ammar bin Yasser and, and uh, Malik al-Ashtar and Yazid and Aisha and Khalid bin al-Walid. Then you have these... And I would argue that the reason that these historical figures are being added is less because it matches historically speaking, but because, but because rather, coming back to the framing idea, that it gives a sense of historical authenticity, quote unquote, and legitimacy. So when uh, modern day uh, Shi militiamen in, in Syria say that, they're, that Zainab will not be taken captive in Syria twice, meaning you know, she being represented by her shrine, 
that um, the comparison you might remember this rebel commander Abu Sakr who ate the, or took a bite of the liver or the heart and even he changed which organ it was uh, you know in different interviews but the, some Shia militias are both, uh, they're just like he's just like his descendant Hind Hind bin Uqba did this and they had they made a poster and they had the scene from Mustafa Akkad's wonderful film not the most wonderful scene of, of Hind with uh, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib and thank you and um, and then finally, uh, just a, a last kind of example that um, you know, even someone like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or um, Zawahri when he was eulogizing did not try to take Hassan and Hussein, Imam Hassan and Hussein away from the Shiites and say, no, no, they really belong to us. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in one of his uh, speeches, which all kind of blend into each other, um, say, you know, the Rafada tried to uh, fool us, but really the, the descendants of Hassan and Hussein cannot be fooled by the Rafada. And, um, the, uh, when the Iranian consulate was bombed in Beirut in, in February 2014, the group that carried it out uh, named the unit that did it after Hussein bin Ali, things like this. Or, and then there's also, of course, the idea of defending Aisha, the honor of Aisha, or, the, or Omar or Abu Bakr. And then from people such as Yasser al habib this very minoritarian voice, um, who is very vulgar and very... I mean, I think even calling him minoritarian is probably too generous, but, um, but he has been, he's in uh, ISIS propaganda, he's been mentioned by Jay al Islam, by Zahra Malouch, he's been mentioned by Al-Shabaab, so his sort of social media presence has a very kind of strong, um, uh, it's very strong. Um, just to conclude, so these, this kind of framing and, and claiming of historical and, and sort of quote-unquote religious authenticity uh, in conflicts is meant to sort of do uh, for social mobilization purposes. And the idea is that the, the time, the contemporary enemies are tied to historical villains, portraying modern conflicts as extensions of the past. Their competing mobilization frames of these different groups are dialogic, and they draw upon, they inform one another, and they draw upon quote unquote religious and sectarian or, or communal, communitarian motifs and language as yet another way, in addition to political and socio political and economic grievances, of justifying their armed response, which is often, of course, shockingly brutal to perceive existential threats to the communities that they say that they're representing. And the closing point would be that these discourses are neither certainly wholly religious, I mean, they're, they're really religio-political or political, you know, however we want to put that, but they're, and they're not solely political, but they're this combination and amalgamation of both. So when people, uh, you know, like ISIS or Abdullah al the Saudi preacher in Syria, say, for example, the last sort of anecdote, when they, when Syrian rebels who have a new offensive in, uh, to the south of Aleppo, captured the, this village of Al-Ais. He went to the mosque where Akram Mukabi, the head of uh, Harakat Hezbollah Mujaba, one of these Shiite uh, militias, had been last year, and also Qasem Soleimani, to the mosque, and he said, we have retaken Al-Ais of Khalid ibn al-Walid, and so rejoice, O oh, descendants of the Sahaba, that we have taken revenge for, revenge for you. And in the sermon that he gave to the fighters there, he said, we're taking revenge also for Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha. Right from the Rafa to the defiled her. Thank you.